I've always had my foot in the startup world. The startup path was always the way for me. And in 2016, classic startup story, I was digging through my gym bag, couldn't find my headphones. Classic Nike duffel that we all got in high school. We took on like weekend trips and stuff. And I was at the gym and I'm emptying it out, pulling the plastic piece out of the bottom and finally found them. And, and it was this really frustrating moment. That was the inciting incident that kicked this whole thing off. I was like, man, there has to be something better. And we looked around and we're like, there's nothing. Like gym bags haven't changed in 40 years. Let's do this. You don't mind sharing what did your product startup costs end up being roughly? So cheap. We were bootstrapped as hell. Have you guys heard about this? The Amazon aggregator Thrasio files for bankruptcy after raising billions with a B, billions from investors. This was kind of wild. This made the waves on Twitter for a day or so. And basically everyone was trying to have their take on this. And yeah, what do you guys think about this? What if I told you there's a hidden revenue channel right here in your store? Research shows 70% of all online shopping carts are abandoned before checkout. That's where Live Recover comes in. We help you recover up to 30% of abandoned carts with live agents interacting with your customers through SMS. Live Recover is a tested and proven boost for your sales. Try it now for only $49. Welcome to the first episode, e-commerce live, where we're going to be bringing together the best founders and friends discussing the latest in D2C and digitally native brand building. Both Colin and myself are recovering D2C founders and now working on the software side at Live Recover. Excited. Today, we have two very special guests. Going to turn it over to Colin here. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Colin. We have two guests with us today. We have Caleb. Caleb is the founder and CEO of Haven. Haven makes incredible bags if you guys are wondering for athletes he just concluded a partnership with crossfit games so that's absolutely crushed caleb's also super into health and wellness amazing if you need any health advice go to caleb we also have jeremiah who's former founder of colorado glasses and now he's the ceo of no commerce which basically provides the best post-purchase surveys you could find anywhere in the world. And he has a treasure trove of data for us that we're going to be going into later today, but it's exciting. He's just sitting on amazing data and trends that we're going to dive into. Yeah. Awesome. So wanted to kick it off and start just with a little bit of background from you, Caleb. I find always one of the most interesting things and most useful things for the community is hearing the story of how you ended up What's the genesis of Haven? How did you end up starting that? And what were you doing before? Yeah, I've always had my foot in the startup world. I was pre-med in college for a long time. That's part of why health and fitness, but then I switched over to business. And that was right around the time that Gary Vaynerchuk was like pushing Facebook for businesses. So I'm older than I look. And I was like, I don't know, that kind of makes sense. And so I got my feet wet in social media and social media management earlier than basically anyone else in my school. And then that led me to this startup event. And then I managed this startup event where we got people like Gary Vee to speak in the Midwest for about four years. I was running that. And then I started working with startups, running growth, and then started a couple of my own tech. So I've done the opposite of what you guys have done. I started in tech and now I'm in e-commerce and the startup path was always the way for me. And in 2016, classic startup story, I was digging through my gym bag, couldn't find my headphones, classic Nike duffel that we all got in high school. We took on like weekend trips and stuff. And I was at the gym and I'm emptying it out, pulling the plastic piece out of the bottom and finally found them. And, and it was this really frustrating moment. That was the inciting incident that kicked this whole thing off. I was like, man, there has to be something better. And we looked around and we're like, there's nothing like gym bags haven't changed in 40 years. Let's do this. Dude, I can totally relate to losing things under the plastic. Uh, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Uh, super cool. And that you've just been entrepreneurial kind of thread throughout. Was that in you even earlier in high school before that did you just always have this urge to lead or create or build <laughs> like what where did that come from do you think yeah to a certain degree i mean i had some like traditional jobs like at restaurants and stuff but then i also had like a mowing business but i wasn't like the kid who like built an empire as a high schooler or something like i know some people like that and i was like no that wasn't me and somewhat entrepreneurial always like very like leadership focused always like led groups and got involved at the highest levels i could in anything else was involved in. One of the cool things you've done with Haven has been on strategic partnerships and influencer marketing. Could you speak to 
kind of that path, what you've learned and what you think is most interesting in that space? Yeah, it all stems with product for us. So we didn't just do a better version of what's out there. And that leads to a lot of things. It's it's all centered around this idea of category creation and doing that in our space and with the product that we have and how much it costs to make. And so therefore how much we have to charge for it, we end up with this really premium product. It's a $300 gym bag. And that's quite higher than every other bag out there, unless you're talking about like a luxury option. And that lends itself to seeding in a way that most products don't. Smaller products or subscription products, you're going to try to send to influencers and sometimes you get some, sometimes you don't. We kind of have the reverse thing happen to us, which is very special and very rare. And that is that people come to us asking for our product. It had happened with some really cool people early on. And then the last year has really taken off where, you know, our tagline is we're an organized bag for high performance and professional athletes. And we say that because professional athletes athletes weekly DM us and ask to get their hands on the bag. They want the product. They literally tell us like, I have NFL players making millions of dollars a year. And they're like, don't talk to my agent. Like, I don't don't care about all that. Like, I just want your bag and I'll film a video for you. And you can have ad rights. Like they're just like super supportive, really interested in what we're doing. They get it right away when they see it. And that's what we've kind of built the company on the last three years is a lot of influencer seeding with these kind of like special relationships. And it all stems back to like, it's an interesting product they actually want. And it's a high price point. So it actually like adds quite a bit of value there. Did you find it challenging to build that high of a quality of products? Sounds like that's your first time diving into manufacturing. And I think it feels like that's the benefit of having a higher ticket item where even a reasonably well-known athlete say is still hitting you up to get a hookup. I just ordered one. I had to think about it though for a couple of days. I was like, man, this is, seems like an awesome bag. I definitely need to solve this problem, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, totally. It took us the better part of a year to find a factory that would actually work with us. So it was in the early days. That was back in like 2019 or so. And everyone told us no. And it's this really kind of wild part of our story where we had a lot of grit and a lot of resilience because every single person we talked to was just like, that's impossible. You can't make that. We even talked to this. Um, we talked to this back in my hometown in Nebraska. And this person had made bags for Nike and Reebok and like, you know, $100,000 or 100,000 unit runs. Like somehow we had heard about her from someone, you know, because we were telling everyone, we're like, yeah, we're working on this bag project. We have no idea what we're doing. We're trying to figure it out. And a few people were like, oh, if you talked to this person, you know, she's been involved in, in bags. And we're like, wait, in Omaha? That's crazy. And eventually through person to person to person, we get a meeting with this person. We're like, oh my God, she's going to like solve all their problems. She's going to help us figure this out. And we sit down and we talk with her and she just obliterates our dreams, just shits all over them. She's just like, you're going to need $50,000 for molds. You're going to have MOQs, minimum order requirements of 10,000 units. It's going to cost you hundreds of thousands. Of and she's just like stacking up. And at this point, we had spent no money. We were just like, we're designing, we're asking questions, we're figuring it out. And she's like, you're going to need hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we're like, cool. And so we just kept figuring it out. We kept asking people and we finally got a factory to make a sample. It took forever and they make it. And they're like, hey, this is really hard to make. It's not mass made manufacturable. There's no way you can make this at scale. And so we just kept going. This was just like a year of hitting dead ends and then getting a glimpse of hope and then hitting a dead end and kind of rinse and repeat. And then we eventually went to outdoor retailer in the largest outdoor show in Colorado. And we connected with a couple of brands there that we had been talking with a really big camera bag company. And long story short, they introduced us to their factory. We knew their quality because they're making these really high quality camera bags, really great brand doing volume. And so we're like, we bet they can do it. And they did it. And we've been with them now for four years. Did you you literally go to OR to find a manufacturer, like go talk to companies and be like, hey, who is manufacturing for you? Yeah, we did it the opposite way though, because it was like a last ditch, like we have no idea what to do here. And one of my good friends was like, have you thought about going to outdoor retailer? I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Like talk to people? Like, and then we saw you know, there's like four levels to the building that it was in. And the bottom level was factory sourcing. And I was like, there's factories there. And so we we're like, that's how we're going to find it. And we talked to those factories and they weren't very good. And just by happenstance, we talked to this camera bag company and we were working with them on some other like climate neutral stuff. And then at one point they had asked like, Hey, do you need help with anything else? And we we're like, actually, we're on the hunt for a factory. And they're like, we'll introduce you to ours. We're like, Oh my God. 
Would you be able to share the camera bag company? Oh yeah, it was Peak Design. Oh, I love the Peak Design guys. Yeah, cool. they're great. That's like amazing. arguably the most successful Kickstarter company ever. They've sold over like $20 million yeah. on Kickstarter. You can find this out, you have to kind of dig for it, but they're roughly like an 80 to $100 million a year company. Like they are massive Whoa. and they're producing really high quality products. And there's some really cool articles about like their business work culture. Like during the summer, they do like 35 hour weeks. They've only got like 30 people on the team. They obviously really emphasize design and super high quality and the founders started climate neutral, which is, I think, probably one of the best carbon negative things to be a part of. You don't mind sharing what did your product startup costs end up being roughly? So cheap. We were bootstrapped as hell. And we took the principles of lean startup to this, you know, coming from technology, I was like, step one, talk to people. Does anyone else have this problem? Step two, how do we fix the problem? Okay, it's structure, it's organization, it's durability, it's ventilation, it's a spot for your shoes. Okay, why is this so hard? Why has no one done this? We don't know, we're confused. We're gonna keep doing it. We ripped up an old Nike bag, we duct taped it, we put in cardboard cereal box. Like we ripped up a cardboard cereal box and that made the dividers. We put in a grocery sack. That was the original shoe garage. Stuff that in there. I took this monstrosity to the gym for three months to test it and to show it to people and be like, hey, is, we're making this organized bag. And they're like, what is that piece of trash you're holding? And I'm like, it's our prototype. <laughs> and then by the time we had gotten to the point where we could mass manufacture or we could run our first sample, we were like, okay, let's pre-sell it. Like that's the last step of lean startup, right? Like will some stranger on the internet give you money for your product? And if they will, you have a business. And if they don't, you have nothing, which is why we do the lean startup process rather than putting all the money in it ahead. So to get to that point, we were maybe like two to $500 in of like literally scrappy as hell. It's incredible. Want to pivot a bit your life stack and optimizing wellness. What's your protocol? What do you do in terms of your fit guy, your in fitness? There's a lot of things. I've always been in kind of health and fitness and like eating pretty healthy and been somewhat involved in some type of working out. And over the last, I would say like five years have gotten a lot more serious. And it's in this idea of creating capacity in my life to be able to take on more. Like as a founder of a company, the stress levels really get to unmanageable places. And I was like, okay, so I can either be destroyed by this and like kind of end the company and like end this journey and like go just get a job and be like, hey, that was too much. Or I can figure out a way to like grow and absorb and not just like survive, but actually thrive. And so I just started listening to what people were saying around me. And this is kind of generally how I take on everything in life is, you know, what does the expert say? Can I test that? And then once I get into it, how do I tweak it so it works really well for me? And a lot of the basics that Andrew Huberman talks about work really well. But I have like all the protocols, like I have a morning routine, I have an evening routine. I am really consistent on my sleep. I shut my work off at a very specific time. There's always more work as a founder. And I've had some bits where I've been really deep in it and like working the super late nights, but then you work a super late night and then you're just trashed the next morning. So like, was it really worth the trade-off? Like generally no. And sometimes you're trashed for like two days because you're like, well, I worked till 1 a.m. I was fucking grinding it out. And then you're just like, well, the next two days were actually like an offset to that. Or if you did keep grinding, like we all know the science behind like, you know, you really only have like four ish hours of like deep, solid work in you per day. And that was like from some of the smartest, best people in history. If you read Cal Newport's deep work. And so you kind of like start putting these things together and you just start thinking logically about it. And you're like, okay, cool. Like staying up late to work on this is actually pretty stupid. And so the computer gets shut off at eight, the red light goes on at nine, we read and then fall asleep at 10 and then up at like six to seven morning routine, manifestation, meditation, all of the morning stuff, either walking or if a uh, Currently, I'm doing two a day, so I'm like running in the mornings and, and then a healthy breakfast and some coffee and some nootropics. And part of this is also I have ADHD and I was on Adderall for two years and I eventually kind of got tired of that because it basically made me feel like a piece of wood. I had like no emotion and no feeling. And I was like, hey, I'm really effective. I can crush an eight hour day, but like I am dead inside. I was like, I'm tired of that. And so it's been like a three year journey of being off of that and finding out what works for me to help get my brain on track. And it's it's all of these other things that are related to healthy lifestyle, health and fitness and wellness and structure and finding the freedom in that to be able to still be really effective and really focused. I believe there's a lot more that as humans we can tap into. And I'm currently on this bend of talking to people. Sheryl Sandberg came out with this really famous thing like health, family, fitness, business, 
friends like choose three or whatever. And I'm, 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 I'm like on this thing where I'm calling bullshit on it because I've been able to choose all five. And I know a lot of other people in my circles who've been able to choose all five. And it's just a matter of being disciplined and creating capacity and stacking those things. Like you can't just cold turkey, do all of those things. Like I couldn't two years ago, step into where I'm at now. But over the last two years, I've added this on, this on, I've added this on, and it's all been net positive, net benefit things. And I think that's possible for everyone. That's interesting. I love hearing like what you're doing because I think it's super interesting. I am a dad of a one-year-old and a three-year-old and just a startup founder as a, so like 2020 pandemic hits when my wife's three months pregnant with her first child. And then we started business later. And so like the last four years have been crazy. And so I just signed up for a half marathon in two months because I'm like, I got to get fit. So that's my my thing. So anyway, I love hearing where you're what you're working on. I did buy into the Cheryl Sandberg pick three, but I think part of yeah. that's maybe season of life oriented. Like at this stage of like small kids, it's like literally like mornings are just like get the kids out the door. Then it's like get the work done. Then it's like get the kids fed to bed. And then it's nine o'clock, like 830 at night, right at that point. I don't know. I'm curious what your take is on that. Because I, I know you said you've got some people that are doing all five well. So I'm curious, is that like, do you think that that's always applicable? Or do you think that maybe there's certain seasons of life where you do have to pull back a little bit based on like what you've seen from your experience? I love the word you just used. I'm the biggest fan of it. And that's seasons. And a season could be a couple weeks or a month. A season could be a couple years. And not having children myself, like I'm definitely, I'm definitely not going to like, anyone who has kids can definitely do this. Like, I don't know. All my older siblings have like three to five kids and I see them like living their lives and whatnot. But I have seen some people and this is what kind of gives me hope with kids and mm -hmm. they're also fit and they're also running a business and they also have a friend life. And so I don't exactly know how to do that with kids, but I mm -hmm. see some people doing it and it's probably still a little bit more pared back than let's say what I'm doing in my life because exactly what you're saying, you know, that you've got so many things to do with your kids and managing that. Yeah. But I think there's a way to kind of like still build some capacity and not use it as an excuse. Like you're looking at a marathon now and I think a lot of people can use like kids or, or anything, you know, work as an excuse to not add anything and just let it completely take over your life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I like what you said about you don't just start with doing everything. You start with like build all those pieces in. So anyway, it's cool to hear your journey of over the last few years. I also have ADHD. So I tried the Adderall thing for 60 days. I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> so <laughs> it's cool to hear that. I, I appreciate it. All right, we're going to pivot to some news. Colin, can you pop up our headlines Let's we were going to go over? Little intro for Haven right here. Ooh, Beautiful. Nice. Little intro for no. Look at that. Okay, sweet. So we can start right here. So first one is why direct to consumer darlings such as Casper, Auburn's and Peloton are now struggling. We got some serious companies declaring bankruptcy, including the WIC wine subscription box company. What do you guys think about this? Like, is this the path that a lot of companies are taking? Is this just weeding out the herd, so to speak? Or is this kind of a macro thing? That's interesting. Somebody was posting on Twitter the other day talking about Yeti and like what Yeti's been doing and how like they're absolutely crushing buying back stock and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So my inclination would be that like it's not necessarily that all of D2C. I mean, but Yeti also didn't really start D2C. So there's there's like a lot more nuance there for sure. I wouldn't think that like everybody is going towards bankruptcy in this space. But I do think that like depending on the one downside to starting a business with a lot of financial backing is that sometimes you don't build efficiencies early on. Like Caleb, your story is a great example of like when you're hustling for and, and you're like trying to make every dollar count and you're bringing in the revenue before you've actually got the product and all that, like that just builds a different muscle. And it does seem like a lot of the companies that are going out of business were heavily funded companies from the outside. Yeah. On some of it, it feels like these businesses are just really easily to run poorly and mm -hmm. lose a lot of money while not growing or having great margins. And I don't know if that's different from other businesses where you can be kind of a less efficient operator and still pull off good profits, but it feels like in D to C kind of have to be a mastermind to yeah. not just take on these massive losses and actually scale. Like Caleb, did you end up taking any outside capital? I know we met through an investor where you were considering <laughs> it. So kind of interesting to hear <clears throat> where that led or where your head's out there. Yeah, we haven't taken any institutional. We have a, we did a small like friends and family round and we've mostly just worked with debt and that's worked really well for us. And it's also like very limited and you're not quite as splashy with it. And I agree that, you know, if you 
dump a bunch of cash in, yeah, you've got an opportunity to grow fast and like get into the market and like run. But then if you're just kind of pushing off profitability because you've got that stack of cash or you know you're going to just raise another round, like I think we all have kind of come around to understand that DTC is not tech. You can't just raise Mm -hmm. five rounds to get to a series F and be like, now we're going to be profitable. I think Warby Parker is still posting like $80 million losses. I, I like them, but like it's just not sustainable. Corey, I think what you said about like the, you do have to be really good. You have to be a really good operator. Like the nine operators podcast. I love listening to those guys because I I listen to them. I'm like, wow, the stuff that they're talking about is applicable to every single business. Like every business needs to be thinking about things at that level. Like when I had my own D2C brands, I just got into this weird cash cycle that ultimately killed it where it was you know, buying inventory, selling, and you just like using debt to like get the inventory. And then the next thing you know, like everything seems like it's going well. And if you're not on top of the numbers, you go from like, oh, this works to we just hit a slow season, we can't pay the debts anymore. And now it's over. That's what happened to me anyway, because I didn't know how to manage the the cash flow the right way. Yeah, I see this as a huge opportunity for anyone who does operate efficiently. When you look at the VC market, it was a exceptionally high amount of VC dollars over the past 20 years went into retail. It was like 30, 40%, over 50, 60 billion of capital. And that just is competition in the ad markets, you know, for talent, all these other things that made it really easy to inefficiently run one of these things. I I feel like this will open up more opportunity for brands like Caleb and our friends over at Ridge and other businesses (laughs) that know how to run a tight ship. Yeah, I think that's mm-hmm. the goal is, I mean, we're kind of always looking at debt options and like, you know, what, as we grow, like what becomes available to us. And we're not closed off to even the equity conversations, but a lot of them were also like just very repetitive and it just kind of seemed like there was a, an amoeba of people moving around saying like, oh, it's got to be subscription. It's got to be CPG. And I was like, hi, have you heard of the 14 other billion dollar luggage companies that aren't subscription or CPG? And they're, they're doing great. And now like, as we, for like us, like, you know, as we've kind of like tipped over a couple of different numbers. And I think if you're looking at debt or investment, like looking at it as like fuel on the fire, like we're going to do this regardless, we'll be profitable by the summer. Um, We just got net 90 payment terms, like we've got some really great things set up. And if we were to put cash on it now, it just allows us to move a little bit quicker, but with the same goal in mind of being profitable, being strict about how we're growing all that. Yep. What type of debt nice. did you do? Like inventory financing or receivables? Every or? single type of debt available Everything. to us. <laughs> yeah. Above, yeah. 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 Shopify Thanks. capital, sellers financing. I've had a conversation with every other person out there. We have a small SBA loan. We have a small loan from like an angel group, not an investment, just a, a loan that they do. And now we're talking to a couple of like private equity, larger groups that are interested in larger forms of debt. And so they might, there might be an option to kind of like refi some of that and then add on some growth capital capital as well. Yeah. Nice. And that's another thing too, is like, you know, we all know, like, you know, you listen to some smart people break down how Shopify capital and like rev based financing is absolute shit. But also if you're a founder and you're like looking at what you're doing and you're like, well, I need money. And so I could shut the company down or I could take this really crappy loan. You're like, I guess I'm gonna take the crappy loan. Like Shopify yeah. capital, like, it, you know, might be bad, but like I've taken it five times and they've yep. given us nearly a million dollars that we've paid back. And like, it's been incredible. It's the reason that we're here. Well, sweet guys, let's move on to the next one. Have you guys heard about this? The Amazon aggregator Thrasio? Is that, mm-hmm. did I say that right? Thrasio? Yep. Files for bankruptcy after raising billions with a B, billions from investors. This was kind of wild. This made the waves on Twitter for a day or so and basically... Everyone was trying to have their take on this. And yeah, what do you guys think about this? I love this was someone posted this financial. If you look at their revenue, so in 2019 for, I guess, the UK business, I don't know if this is overall, but only six and a half million of revenue. And they're showing EBITDA from amortization of intangibles. But if you look at their income from operations, negative five million on that six and a half mil rev. So I guess, yeah, pretty, pretty rough, but... I don't know too much about this business. I don't know if you guys do. I, I did read the skimmed really the TechCrunch article on it. It was interesting because it, it sounds like they're kind of riding the ship, so to speak. So I don't fully understand how all of it works, but it sounds like they're, you know, doing the bankruptcy thing and then they've got they'll have some cash in the bank and they think they can kind of like get it straightened out. So I don't think they're like gone, gone, but it is interesting to see something that looks so promising a couple of years ago. Billions raised, like ten billion dollar valuation. I think the last I think what I saw, I may be misquoting this, but the last valuation put it at like a couple hundred million. That's got to be tough. At this stage of my life, nobody would ever give me $3 billion. 
So I don't want to like trash the people who, who built this because obviously like they did something incredible just getting to that point. But it's got to be really hard being on the inside of that and having to like kind of get get all that right and, and move forward. So yeah, hopefully for them, they're able to do it. It's interesting. I think it's kind of like, you know, those movies that occasionally come out that have like 12 tier one actors in them. And you're like, whoa, look at that lineup. And then you watch it and you're like, that movie was mid. Uh, and I feel like at this point, we kind of know like if a company raises billions of dollars and gets every celebrity and every top level business person in like what was that stupid video thing like quirp or quip or whatever and like they raised billions from all the like yeah from all the like time warner people and then it like it lasted like a week and everyone was like this sucks i feel like we should kind of like see to see this now like here's there's a pattern so this is aaron over at abrez so they just launched on tiktok shop and then i think within a couple days i think the first week they did about twenty eight thousand dollars I guess both of you guys could talk to this. Like, how have you seen TikTok shop? Oh, look at this. We got it right there. Sponsored. Sponsored. How have you guys been seeing kind of TikTok shop play out? I mean, Jeremiah, you probably have a ton of insights into this with how how brands are doing it. And then Caleb, are you considering it like pretty seriously with you guys or for a scale that matter? Yeah. So from our side, the last year, the question, how did you first hear about us was answered 16 million times on our platform. So we've got a bit of like trend analysis over time. But what's interesting is we saw TikTok in October. We're just looking at website conversions, right? So basically, if somebody purchases on TikTok shop, they're getting pulled out of that. So they're they're no longer in that equation. And so starting in October, we saw a, a big drop that kind of flattened actually, like October, it dropped and then it slowly fell down a little bit more in November, December. No other channels had any drops like that throughout the year. And that lined up with the launch of TikTok shops. So I think what we're seeing, and that was about wow. a 20% drop, give or take a little bit. So I think that that's pretty indicative of, of shops like immediately grabbing a lot of impact. I'm really curious to see how that plays out over this year. So we'll, we'll be tracking those trends. We haven't followed up with TikTok specifically on that to be like, does this line up with you, what you all are seeing? And then the other thing we saw there is that we also ask how long did you know about us before placing your first purchase? Some of that earlier purchase behavior, like less than a day, less than a week, people who are who just like today or this week found out about the brand, that number was shifting longer on TikTok in the back quarter of the year as well, which tells me that like TikTok shops really is doing a good job of introducing and getting somebody to convert immediately is my take on it. So could be wrong. There's a lot of a lot of missing data we don't see there, but I do think that that's what's happening. So I think overall it's going to be a huge positive for brands. You guys touching it, Caleb? We are not touching it yet. What we've seen so far with TikTok and TikTok shop is it does work a lot better for shorter consideration period products i.e. cheaper products. So a $300 gym bag, I mean, even like you said, like you've been kind of mulling it over a few days before you pull the trigger. Like it's just not typically, it doesn't typically work super well on TikTok or TikTok shops. And we've been pretty hyper-focused on like being the one channel that works really well for us, which is Facebook ads. We have great return on those. And so that's kind of where we're at. I'm curious to see, I'm like stoked when anyone sees some success anywhere, like, you know, cheer my friends on. I think Isaac actually from Mini Katana has a great take on TikTok shops, which is like, it's shit. Cause like most of the products on there are just like Timu knockoffs. So it's, I'm stoked to see that Aaron and anyone else can like get some traction on there, but as a whole of a product, they need to fix this very quickly because all of the, everything else on there is really just garbage. And I would imagine they are. I think I saw somebody post recently, they were hiring like 500 positions for shops, something like that. It was like a crazy number. So yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, moving on to the near and dear Sean Frank, 2024 best year ever for e-com ever. U.S. Census data shows e-com peaked at 16.1% of all retail. Do you guys think it's only up from here? I think it'll be slow, just like it kind of was pre-COVID, right? Just like slow, continual growth. Yeah. I'm on board with anything that's positive, right? Like if someone's going to be like, it's going to be the best year. I'm like, hell yeah, it is, brother. Let's go. Well, that's that's the thing. When e-com's at 16% penetration, even if the macro economy is going down, as long as e-commerce is taking a bigger share of the wallet, if you're playing in that digital space, you can capture that. And when you're a small, smaller or up and coming brand, there's only opportunity for you, yeah. right? Like those things don't affect you. You're just growing audience until you peaked audience like a Nike. Yeah. But yeah, China is at like 45, 40 to 60% e-commerce Wait. penetration. So Seriously? there's just so much opportunity. Yeah, let's move on. Oh yeah, there you go. There's the chart, 46%. Uh-huh. There you go. Wow. Um, we can share this 
in just confirming notes. Corey just confirming the stats he's pulling from right honestly there. the number that's most interesting to me here from a u.s standpoint is uk because i think like the reality is like culturally the u.s is very different from south korea the u.s is very different from china yeah. but like uk and u.s are much more similar culturally I do think UK is obviously a smaller country, so it's probably easier to move goods around. A lot of same day delivery. Yeah, that so like that probably helps a lot. But I do think like tracking what what the UK is doing over time is probably a good indicator of what's possible in the US over time. Well, that's it for us, Jeremiah. Do you want to go into the data? I'm curious cool. about the data you're seeing, the trends you're seeing. Yeah. I want to see some some juicy, tasty trends that we can <laughs> we can give to the people. All right, sounds good. So, Caleb, I'm actually going to touch on something here that I, I'm I want to get your take specifically on this because you were talking about like high OV and TikTok and stuff. I'm going to cover just real quick like what we saw last year for survey responses and discovery trends. So, we in our platform we have five questions that. There's more than that. Five specifically that we're looking at all the time that are what we call benchmarkable questions. So how did you first hear about us? What brought you to our site today? If they said they came from an ad, asking them where the ad was that they saw. And then who? how long did you know about us before placing your first purchase? And who is this purchase for? Those five questions. So specifically looking at how did you first hear about us? This data set that I'm going to show here is a subset of people that answer both that question and the question of how long they knew about the brand. So that's like 9 million respondents, but still a good data set over the 12 months. What I thought was really interesting is if you just kind of think about the theme of 2023, a lot of it was about profitable growth, right? And so looking at word of mouth and other, the, those two channels saw a pretty strong, consistent trend over the course of the year. Now, word of mouth is always up in November and December. And the reason for that is gifting, right? So people are buying gifts around the holiday season. So you can see here this blue line, word of mouth, 19% of purchases in, in November and 21.5% in December said that they came from word of mouth. And that's basically like, you know, my, my mom is like, hey, Jeremiah, what do you want for Christmas? And I tell her and she goes and buys it, right? So I thought that was an interesting trend. I, as you can see, just like throughout the year, there's a little bit of an upward trend and then a strong upward trend at the end. And these other channels were really trending up strongly and what other usually is is like smaller sort of opportunities that we're maybe not picking up in our our larger data set so a lot of times that is some word of mouth things that are just described differently we're actually going to be like kind of restructuring and cleaning this data more over time so i think we'll hopefully have a little bit better view but regardless we would kind of consider this like organic non-paid and we saw a pretty strong upward trend throughout the year in that like organic sort of growth which i think lines up with brands trying to be more profitable in, in 2023. Looking at paid channels specifically, there was a little bit of a downward trend. It's harder to see that overall in this chart. So this is basically filtering out the those two organic buckets and then showing the percentage of total. You can see Facebook led the way. So this is people saying that they discovered a brand on Facebook. Instagram was second. And so you can see Instagram has like a little bit of a slight downward trend. This is Google really trended up throughout the year. So especially Q4, this is kind of common too. Again, gifting. Somebody says, hey, I want this thing. You go, you search for it and you buy it. So that makes sense. But then we also saw like TV and YouTube have a pretty strong upward tick at the end of the year too. And I think that if you look at the data, which I don't show here, but a lot of times those channels take a longer time to, to convert. But regardless, basically the overall trend is throughout the year, Facebook, which has a pretty good like click to conversion tracking path trended up. Google, which has a good click to conversion tracking path trended up and everything else trended down just slightly. Here's what that drop off, by the way, that I was talking about with TikTok. So you can see TikTok was up here around 10% and then just dropped down to about eight and just slowly dropped down a little bit more in Q4 and shops launched right here. So timing wise, I believe that's probably because of the launch of shops. But anyway, we'll, we'll keep doing more research on that this year. If you uh, plot this against eyeballs, yep. where people are actually YouTube is the big opportunity for brands because yes, that is where people spend them. That, that's like the growing click Caleb, you guys doing anything on I guess you guys work with influencers. So there's some natural distribution there. Yeah, we're not deep in it yet, but it's definitely a high priority for this year to be pushing out our own content and working with more YouTubers as well. Cool. Yeah, and I think I'm going to show you something on YouTube specifically here in a moment because I, I think that's spot on, Corey. So what I wanted to highlight here that I think is really interesting is so we, we looked at the first click source associated with these survey responses. So in this context, so these bars are the survey responses. So black is people who answered TikTok, 
red is people who answered Instagram, yellow people who answered Facebook, green people who answered Google, and then these are the click sources. So like Facebook, click source, 35% of people who answered Facebook had a first click associated with Facebook in terms of like the click data we have. This unknown bucket over here means that we just don't have a click. So it's missing click data come through as direct. And this is to be clear too, this is Shopify data. So it's missing some data compared to other sources, but directionally it's always been really accurate. So it's interesting to see this. So you see basically like about a third of all of these don't have a click, but among the ones that have a click, Facebook, 35% of respondents have a Facebook click. Google, 38%, 39% basically of Google respondents have a Google click. But then you look at TikTok. Of people who answered TikTok, only 10% have a TikTok click. Of people who answered Instagram, only 11% have an Instagram click. This one is interesting though. So the other bucket here is actually really high on Instagram. We need to dive into that a little bit more. But my theory is that this actually is coming through into platforms like Triple Whale, North Bean. I think it's the, the UTM tagging messed up our tracking here a little bit. So likely we're actually seeing, you know, probably a little bit higher percentage that is actually coming through to the visualization that brands are actually seeing in Instagram. But the point here is that the channels that were trending down throughout the year, YouTube, TikTok, oftentimes are the ones that are least likely to have a click associated with the survey response. So real quick, looking at this, YouTube, TikTok, and TV specifically, you can see people who answered YouTube, 8% had a YouTube click, 30% had a Google search click. So, and then in TikTok, again, that 10%, 34% had a Google search. TV, obviously we don't have a TV click, that just doesn't exist. But it's interesting to see 27% from Google search. This one actually crushes other search engines. So I think this is probably indicative of just the older demographic looking at, you know, they're probably using Bing and some of those other tools. So just to kind of recap here though, I think it leads to less confidence and spending in those places because you don't see that click data come through. It's not showing up in your MTA data. It's not showing up in Google Analytics. It's not showing up in those kinds of places. So while there may be some impact happening there, that's actually not getting measured there. It can lead to like a little bit less confidence and whether that platform is actually working. So I'm curious if that's if that resonates with you or not. We are a sub $10 million brand. And like I said, I like to take advice of the people who've done it and who have been there and who are smarter than me. So like Sean Frank and the operators are like, stop using Triple Whale, no offense, stop using North Theme, no offense, yeah. and go in platform and look at Mer. And so that's what we do. We yeah. run on Mer and we look at in platform and we know it's not perfect, but I know I typically make three to five dollars for every dollar I put into the system. And when product is in stock, that jumps to like five to 10. Awesome. I know we're up on time and really appreciate your guys' time. I know you're super busy. Thank you for joining. First yeah, episode. You. Hope to have you guys back at some point. <laughs>